Studios, the AusBiz COB is the key stuff you need to know about the day in business and finance. Welcome to the COB this Thursday. I'm Juliette Sarley. Great to have you with us. Let's have a quick look at where the market is set to close out the day's trade. It has been another session of weakness, although we did attempt a little bit of positivity uh, between that lunchtime uh, break. It looks like we're going to close out by uh, down by about four tenths or five tenths of one percent there on the CBO 200. The ASX 200 off by six tenths of one percent as we head into the match out or 43.7,300. 350 points. A lot of themes for us to really get across today, which is why we saw uh, that weakness coming through in the market. So let's get through some of those. And really the key one is these rate cut bets starting to ease once again. You had that really strong retail print out of the US for the month of December, starting to see uh, investors and traders pair back the likelihood that you would see a, Dece- uh, a rate cut, excuse me, by March. In fact, about 50 50 the bet now when as earlier in the year or late last year it really was closer to that 70 percent level uh, of course this comes on the back as well of those comments from the feds waller earlier in the week too suggesting that uh, it was too early to start to say that we would be seeing a loosening of those monetary conditions here locally we're starting to see some cracks according to oxford economics in the labor market we had uh, about a hundred thousand full-time jobs lost in december Total jobs lost around uh, 65,000 and of course that was versus expectations that you'd actually see an increase in jobs. We know that uh, the job series is always very volatile but certainly uh, that has started to see some likelihoods in terms of what we're going to see from the RBA. The next really big print of course for the Reserve Bank is going to be that inflationary print for the quarter which comes through on the 31st of uh, January. And then nickel woes, of course, hearing from our largest miner, BHP, really alluding to the fact that uh, it may have to address the fact that you've been seeing this commodity uh, slump. And then, of course, as well, a bit of a a glut coming through. They're warning on the battery minerals and the uh, demand from the energy transition. It was supposed to, of course, underpin their strong prices for nickel and lithium, but the battery mineral slump appears to be entering a new phase. So how much is that going to really affect the likes of BHP? All right, let's have a look at uh, some of the sectors that we saw today. Energy stocks, of course, very much still in focus. We're seeing global oil prices very much choppy. This was on uh, this fourth quarter economic growth in China, short of expectations, and also OPEC forecasting that global oil demand will continue to increase strongly in 2025. Taking a look at uh, the REITs as well, the interest rate sector, was under pressure today. Dex is down by about 3.3%. A quick look at industrials as well. Transurban off by 1.4%. And then just getting you to those top corporate stories. I mentioned BHP uh, down by about 1.5%. Look, the mining giant did say WA iron ore production was up 5% quarter on quarter. But as I mentioned, it warned that its nickel division wouldn't be immune to falling nickel prices. Liontown Resources plunging. And this is after the NICE listed lithium giant Al Albemarle sold its 4% stake in the lithium play just three months after abandoning its takeover bid. Ampol also under pressure it reported a 10.5% drop in margins at its Lytton refinery in the fourth quarter on higher crude premiums. And AMP Human Services tumbled. Look at that, down almost 40%. The company issuing a first half profit warning after market. UBS also downgrading the stock to neutral from buy. And looking at EML payments, look, it headed the other way. Uh, it did seem that investors were quite happy by its move to exit its troubled Irish business. I spoke to Harry Watt from Shore & Partners about that earlier. That's a good interview you can catch up with online. Now we welcome though to the COB, David Scott from uh, City Index, uh, or from Stonex, excuse me. David Scott, good good to see you. Um, Just let's talk about what we've been seeing in terms of this market expectation that perhaps a rate cut from the Fed by March is a bit too premature. Look, uh, it's an interesting one because uh, while you mentioned uh, his speech earlier in the week, he mentioned specifically there's going to be a revision to the uh, inflation readings that came out last year. Uh, And he wants to go and see that and that will go and inform whether there's a need to go in March. Look, in every sense, if the the trends that we're seeing in the inflation data do take place, uh, there's every chance that the Fed might go and cut in March as a 
precautionary move. But uh, it really comes down to will they go and cut the five or six or, or seven times, as some people are speculating, over the course of the rest of the year. I, I can understand totally why the markets are still sort of fixated as maybe it's a coin toss, 50-50 either way. But uh, we have to really wait for the upcoming inflation reports and that inflation revision. That will give us a lot of clarity as to what the Fed will likely do. Scott, Scotty, we uh, lost you there, a little bit of uh, frozen tech moves. But I was asking you about what it could all mean for the RBA in terms of, of course, the fact that we had that jobs uh, number, which was always volatile, but, you know, 65,000 jobs lost in December. Well, what does it mean for the RBA? The headlines go and write themselves, uh, you know, 106,000 full-time job losses uh, outside of the pandemic. That's the largest one-month decline on record. But do we really think that that went and took place over the course of the month? Do we really think that uh, over 55,000 jobs were lost? Look, uh, it could be, but it looks like there's a problem with the seasonal adjustment, maybe a change in the way that the seasonal patterns of the labour force takes place. Uh, I think uh, it really comes to that inflation report that's uh, at the end of the month for the RBA. Uh, at this point in time, I don't see any real change at this, uh, this point. Uh, there's going to be cuts coming through. It will likely going to take place in the middle of the year. If it's any earlier, it's almost certain to be driven by offshore factors, not done on what's happening here in Australia. OK, well, let's talk about those offshore factors. I mean, you and I spoke earlier in the week, but since then, of course, we have had that China data dump. And of course, we've seen some big moves coming through in the Hang Seng Index in particular. Just talk us through, I guess, the worries about the, the property cracks in China and what that means for our economy too. Well, we we know that uh, that China is trying to replace what essentially was its biggest growth driver uh, for a long period of time. So much was tied to the fortunes of that property sector. Uh, when you're trying to go and replace that with something else, and obviously that's going to be a big focus of the household sector in particular, it's a uh, no mean feat and it's a pretty big challenge out there. But to me, the, the biggest thing, the biggest concern out there was the, the sharp drop in the uh, population again that we saw last year. That's a structural trend now. It's uh, two years back to back. And when it comes to demand for everything, when you've got less demand coming through, uh, it makes it very difficult to go and get excited about the prospects for those who supply China. And of course, uh, us, uh, you know, mineral wealth uh, to every uh, every corner of the country. But uh, it is a little bit concerning when you know that China's population is now shrinking. And I think that's what really caught the market a little bit of jar that we saw a big acceleration uh, rather than a stabilisation of the population. I also just saw a note from our good friend Kyle Rodder saying that perhaps what we're seeing in Chinese markets is a Trump trade. We know that the election is very much going to dominate uh, global markets over the course of the year. But how are you viewing that in terms of the backdrop of the economic environment and the fact that we are going to be very much focused on what's happening with uh, the US election? Look, uh, every single Chinese index that you go and track at the moment has got an element of geopolitical risk that's attached to it. Uh, but that's just one of many risks at the moment. You mentioned the property markets, the economic risks, you talk about earnings risks. Then you just talk about uh, no, more broadly policy risks and, and credit risks that exist in the, uh, the Chinese economy with such heavy indebtedness. And uh, I can see why there's so many concerns out there. Look, it's incredibly cheap out there when you're going screened against other regional indices, but it's cheap for a reason. And until those concerns are addressed, uh, it's really difficult to get excited about China. Everyone wants to go and buy it. Everyone can see that the potential, everyone can go and see that how cheap it looks. But uh, uh, there's just too many uh, concerns out there at the moment and I, I don't think we're going to go and dissipate anytime soon. All right, we are getting a little bit of a patchy um, view from you, but I want to ask you quickly, uh, Scotty, about the, the dollar, particularly as it started the Aussie, I mean, to uh, decline following that jobs numbers. But this is all linked to the China story too. It is. Uh, we've seen some form of stabilisation in some of those Chinese equity markets. And the Aussie dollar on days where there's not a lot of other news to go off uh, tends to go and react to that. So we've just seen some form of stabilisation, particularly Hong Kong at this point. Uh, also, some mainland industry uh, indices, I should say, are moving off their lows. When the Aussie sees that, uh, it naturally wants to go and gravitate, and it has fallen. David Scott there. Hopefully we can get him in studio at some point soon. Time for a, a trip from Adelaide to Sydney, perhaps, Scotty. That is David Scott from City Index. Let me talk you through some of the other moves that we're seeing in the market and potentially get to uh, what we saw from the stock of the day. That was Ampol. We had Howard Coleman of Team Invest and Grady Wolf from Bell Direct joining Koshi earlier. If you want to buy this, you want to buy it when it's just had 
blood in the streets kind of thing, you know. <laughs> one of those, uh, uh, on the graph there, one of those times when it's really you low. Know, 25, yeah. 27 dollars. You're never going to yeah. pick it exactly, but you know, if it got to somewhere in the mid-20s, you right. start saying, okay, I could at least trade the stock and then I'll sell it again one day in the yeah. mid-30s. Yeah. But you wouldn't be buying it from a point of right. view of wealth. Definitely wouldn't be in it. Right. And I don't think any team <laughs> best members would. But um, no, not at those prices. Because right. I'd I look at it and say, it's near its high PE, it's near its high price. The next couple of years, you'd probably buy it back at 27 or something. Right. And you've got rid of it at 35. Yep. Uh, the market has closed out. Let's have a look at the laggards and leaders, starting with the leaders, the best performers. Core Lithium up 3.7%. Life360, Helia Group, Emerald Resources and Bapcor all looking good. To the downside, though, in terms of the laggards, no surprise, Liontown Resources is there after Albemarle sold out its stake. Uh, Liontown down by almost 10%. Also in the material space, Gl Coronado Global Resources, Siona Mining, Champion Iron. And then we talked about the REITs being under pressure as well. Waypoint, they're off by 4%. In the small end of town, let's have a look at some of the winners. EML, of course, very much in focus. I mentioned I spoke to Harry Watt from Shore and Partners. Look, he was just saying getting out of this troubled Irish business is obviously being seen as a huge high five from the market. EML up by uh, almost 24% there. He was saying, watch that stock, it could get to a dollar. Highfield Resources up almost 17%. Clearview Technology, uh, Airtasker and Fluence also looking good. To the downside in the small caps space, 88 Energy, Santana Minerals, EBR Systems, Peninsula Energy and Globalith off by about 7.3%. Let's take a look at what is on overnight. US retail sales, uh, we already got those. Of course, they were quite upbeat. Um, we will be looking for data on housing starts and building permits, jobless claims, the Philadelphia Fed Manufacturing Index also due. And in terms of some of the earnings, PPG, uh, Key Corp, Northern Trust. All right, let's split the page and have a look at what we can expect in the region tomorrow. Uh, CPI for Japan the New Zealand Manufacturing PMI for December. Kelly Partners Group will trade XDiv and Whitehaven Coal among those coming through with a production update. A quick look as well at what we're seeing on the market as we round out the day's trade. Another negative session, four tenths of 1% loss on the CBO 200. The ASX 200 down by six tenths of 1%, 7,350 looks like where we have uh, settled. Um, so we're just having a quick look as well in terms of what we have seen we mentioned Liontown, Siona, the big drags, uh, six tenths of 1%, 7,346. And nearly all the sectors were lower, nine of the 11 down with uh, financial, actually the best performing up by 0.15% rebounding from its recent decline, but off by about seven tenths of 1% over the past five days. And REITs, healthcare, industrial, energy, material, all the laggards today. All right, another busy day here at Ausbiz. Remember, you can catch up with all of our interviews online. We'll be back bright and early with another full day's trade and the wrap up from the offshore overseas session tomorrow. We'll see you then. Mm -hmm.